Morning, everybody. Can machines think? So 100 years ago, Alan Turing began his famous paper with this very question before rightly deciding that it's actually not a very useful question to ask. Instead, he thought we should focus on what machines can actually do. Turing's vision of artificial intelligence was very different from the computers of the time. He envisaged a computer that you could ask questions of and ultimately be unable to distinguish its between its answers and those of a human. This talk is a history of how we got from the world of 1950 to the world of today, 2050. We take for granted that computers can speak to us in our own words. This is the future you live in today. So when did this happen? How did we get to the world of 2050? When did computers learn how to talk? After Turing, the second half of the 20th century saw a technological revolution. Now, all of you looking around are far too young to remember the late 20th century, but I suspect it probably looks something like this. This was a time of growth and rapid change that merits its own talk. Finance in particular presented many problems that computers were great at because it focused on clearly defined models and numerical systems. But in all this, nothing that matched Turing's vision emerged. Even as the technological revolution continued up to the new millennium and beyond, computers were still falling short of that vision, despite many victories for artificial intelligence. In 1997, Deep Blue beat Garry Kasparov at chess. And over a decade later, the DeepMind AI AlphaGo took on Lisa Doll in the game of Go and won. These successes and the technology that enabled them were revolutionary. But the changes in finance they heralded were more incremental. By the 2000s, increasingly sophisticated investment strategies could play out in microseconds between high-frequency traders. Manual, predictable processes could be automated. But for everyday people, finance changed surprisingly little. People who had filled out forms in branches now filled them out online instead. Calls with advisors were done over video messaging rather than in offices but the experience fundamentally hadn't changed. And the problem is that the real world is not like chess or Go. It's poorly modeled as a game or even as a well-behaved financial system. It's generally much more complicated. The real world is nuanced. It's difficult to break down into a simple set of rules. Something always comes along to further complicate the picture. Of course, we have a technology that grapples with the difficulty of representing a messy world. We have a technology that can represent nuance and variety. Uh, and it's one of our oldest technologies of all. It is, of course, language. Now, computers in 2019 couldn't deal with language. They followed rules without really understanding how they could be subtly broken. They fit any questions you asked into predefined templates. And they struggled as soon as you went off script. This was the gap between the technology available at the end of the 2010s and that which Alan Turing had envisaged all those years ago. And then everything changed. In 2019, there was a breakthrough. We worked out an architecture for machine learning that was ideal for language. Now, these so-called transformers gave us the potential to understand human language. And that potential began to be realized with the release of publicly available large language models, or LLMs, like those that powered ChatGPT a few years later. Now, in finance, 
I would say there were two common reactions. The first reaction was to worry how the AI was going to take all our jobs. This was mostly done by people who, to be fair, didn't have a great grasp of the technology and so ascribed it godlike powers of automation. And it was also done those, by those people who did understand the technology but who were invested in it and so also ascribed it godlike powers of automation. The second reaction in finance was from people who didn't really see the impact of the technology. Finance is a world of numbers. Previous generations of AI had slotted very neatly into that world and their application was obvious. So what if those technologies couldn't talk in human language? It wasn't clear how language abilities would benefit the field of finance. Here's what those groups missed. This revolution wasn't so much about intelligence as it was about language. And because it was about language, that meant it was going to have a huge impact on the world of finance. It's just that that impact was going to be in a very different place to the previous technologies. It was basically going to be at the boundary where numbers met people. This was the moment computers learned to talk. So if the early 2020s was the moment this happened, what did that change actually do? How did that change play out over the next 30 years and lead to the world we live in today? The first impact that this new technology had was on how we shared information. Because once computers can talk, then everything is portable. Picture the scene almost 30 years ago, early 2023. The government has tried to force banks to share information more broadly, but that so, those same banks still jealously hoard your data. They are gatekeepers, and sharing your information is awkward and frustrating. You couldn't just take your information with you because documents weren't portable. They had to be in the right format. They had to match the expectations of whatever system you were trying to use at the time. And the burden of transferring information fell on people. It's probably hard for me to explain to some of you younger people just how unfun it was to have to enter the same basic facts about your life again and again and again to insurance companies to get quotes, to banks to set up accounts, to advisors to get advice. It sucked. Everyone knew that it sucked, but it was the best that we could do. Generative AI changed how we shared information. And this happened in 2023. Now, I'm lucky enough today to have some examples from that time to share with you. These are examples from the company I founded, Multiply, and they're representative of what LLMs were able to bring to finance. LLMs made it much easier to upload information quickly from standardized documents. Click a driving license, for example. As a bank, you needed to collect this sort of information anyway so that you could check your customers who they said they were. But you could use this as the first step of onboarding to collect all the basic information that you needed from your customer. Of course, that wasn't where the technology stopped. It also allowed for data to be extracted from much more complicated documents. Here's an example that, as I near retirement, I'm especially familiar with, a pension statement. These are lightly structured, although they all tend to be slightly different. Generative AI meant that didn't matter. By 2023, it was possible for you to upload a whole pension statement, regardless of format, and your financial advisor could quickly ingest that information. In seconds, it would be ready to be fed into their projection systems to quickly identify any gaps in your retirement needs. But the power of generative AI went further than this, even in 2023, because it opened the possibility of passing documents with 
very little structure at all. So rather than sit and enter data by hand when you were meeting your advisor for the first time or you were signing up for a bank or you were going through those same insurance quote processes, you could just upload your documents instead. And from these documents, you could quickly tell how much insurance cover a person had from their policy documentation. You could tell what their existing financial assets were from their accounting details. You could tell what they had been recommended previously from their existing suitability reports. This was all possible in 2023. Of course, you know this. We now live in a time where your data is extremely portable because the format is just text. Ordinary human text that you and I can type, that we can understand, and that we can move about very easily. I don't need it to be in a PDF format. I don't need it to be an Excel format. It can be an image. It can be a text file. It can be a spreadsheet. If I want to sign up to a new service, I can just take a picture and share my information. Generative AI solved how to interface between natural language and the structured formats that our underlying banking systems understand. And this means that information is ultra portable because the medium is just text. But if AI has changed how we share information with the world, it's also changed how that world shares information with us. Because once computers could talk, everything became personalized. 30 years ago, in 2020, things were in a bit of a mess. News about the world, educational articles from your bank about fraud, market updates from your financial advisor, all of this was rebranded as content. And content was every bit as fresh and exciting and dynamic as that word implies. Finance was a great example of how this content was siloed between different industries. You could read articles on the BBC about interest rates or the budget, but have no sense of how it applied to your own circumstances. Once upon a time, you might have had a financial advisor who would have been able to brief you on the latest news if you had questions. Now you'd have to make do with the odd belated market update email, even supposing you could afford to pay for a financial advisor at all. Generative AI made content selection democratic. Programs that had already existed, ha programs had already existed that could tra travel the internet, blindly harvesting content. These allowed for personalized feeds of information, which was the main pulling power of the social media platforms of the time. But generative AI disrupted this balance because now AI software could go out and scour the web on my behalf and I didn't need programming expertise or control of the Facebook algorithm to guide its searching. It could sample the world of blogs, newspapers, podcasts and the like and find content that was actually interesting and relevant for me. So let's see what was possible again with 2023 technology. Now previously at Multiply, when we'd offered our advice direct to customers, we produced a daily email summarized the key stories of the day in plain English and detailed their relevance for people making financial plans. Now this captured people's imaginations and it was hands down one of the best things we ever did in terms of engagement, in terms of making people care about things, in terms of people helping people understand the world and how their finances related to it. But between scouring the web for interesting content assessing its relevance and actually writing the email. This is something that took a well-practiced individual at least an hour each morning to do. And with generative AI, we were able to automate the whole flow without any human involvement. And we were able to make it better.
So as well as my interests for, and how my hopes for the future, our agent was driven by its understanding of my personal and financial information, and it was able to scour the web on my behalf. It could review each story and assess its relevance to me. It was then able to take the stories it thought I was interested in and make them applicable to me. It was able to rewrite them in terms that made sense to me. It was even able to explain how stories affected me and my finances. Of course, what works for me wouldn't have worked for you or my parents or my kids. My mum would have probably preferred a more verbose style. We were able to accommodate this. And on the other hand, my kids preferred a much more casual, conversational style. And with generative AI, this was no problem. So if that was possible in 2023, what happened between then and now? Generative AI wasn't magic. It couldn't walk around and experience the world. It couldn't match the emotional intelligence of a human being. It fundamentally lacked insight into the human condition. And not everyone understood this at first. Not everyone used generative AI for the good of humanity. The late 2020s saw many once trusted organizations flushing their reputations down the drain by churning out AI generated content. Today we've learned the lessons of that period. We still have human journalists. We still have human financial advisors. We still have people producing interesting things, whether it's short form video, virtual reality films, podcasts, long form articles. But the facts and the ideas that those journalists write about, the news that they uncover, and the things that they discover are brought to me by AI. And I can read it, listen to it, watch it, transform it, in ways that make sense to me. So while generative AI has made good content hard to find in a sea of junk, it's really good at sifting through that junk to find the hidden gems. And because I can talk to it using my own language, power has moved away from content gatekeepers like the big social media networks. The result is we live in a world where everything is personalized because text can easily be understood and transformed by computers based on what we want. So we've talked about how the coming of age of generative AI in the early 2020s meant that data could easily flow into our computer systems. And we've seen how personalization meant data coming out of those systems could be adapted just for us. Combining these two things together gives us an obvious final step. If computers can talk, then everything becomes conversational. Now, looking back, I think this seems entirely unsurprising that conversational interfaces were the big success story of 2020s. There was a reason that it was chat GPT that caught the public imagination first. But it's important to understand why conversational interfaces were so successful, especially in finance, and what made them different from the chatbots of years before. To understand this, you have to understand the challenges faced by people at the time in 2023. The old world, the one where we started our story back in the 20th century, was dead. In this world, humans had given out advice inexpensively. You could have walked into your local bank, been recognized by your local bank manager, who might have personally helped you to get a mortgage. Now that world, if it ever existed, was very definitely gone now. Advice was expensive, banking was impersonal, and you couldn't get hold of people when you needed them. Now the changes that killed the old world actually made things harder for everyday people. Pensions were no longer a benefit that you were entitled to, they were an investment that you had to manage. 
Work was becoming more short term rather than a steadily growing income across your career. Budgeting was a nightmare. You've got to remember that this was before nuclear fusion, the technologies <laughs> of today. So energy in particular was expensive and volatile. All this meant it was enough for most people to get by. Good finances were not the default, even from people who were doing well professionally. Now, generative AI was able to help these people because it meant that some of those lost benefits of the human world could be returned to finance. Let's look at what that meant in practice. Now, at Multiply, we were in the business of delivering good financial advice. And good financial advice is about helping people achieve their goals. The first problem that some people had, though, was that they didn't actually know what their goals, what they wanted to do. Conversations were a great way to explore this because they allowed the user to explore things in an open-ended fashion. This is what human advisors knew. They were great at it. Our conversational advisor at the time could make suggestions and it could adapt to what you wanted. The reality is that people are not always aware of the options they have or what is sensible. When presented with a form to fill in their future plans, they freeze. They don't know where they want to live. They don't know what they want to do. These are things that digital interfaces at the time did not deal well with. Humans, of course, dealt really well with these things. If you had questions, you could get those answered when you, when you had them. The conversation could adapt to your level of understanding, to the things that you were interested in, to your personal desires, the things that you had dreamed about, the future that you wanted to build. And because generative AI systems like the one deployed by Multiply were able to interpret your answers and feed that information through to the same systems and controls that were already in place to generate advice, we had a safety net. This is really important. We did not rely on generative AI's impressive, but ultimately compromised reasoning skills to generate the underlying advice. We used the same systems that had been built for control, that we understood, that we could configure in the ways that represented uh, solid underlying principles. But once that advice had been generated, generative AI could interpret the things your advisor thought you should do in a language that made sense to you. It could adapt that advice for the questions that you had. This is what made it different from something like ChatGPT. Now, up to this point, digital experiences had robbed people of the feeling of being heard. Generative AI helped people feel understood because it listened to things and it reacted to them. Now, prior to this, advice had become heavily caveated, increasingly standardized, thick with risk warnings, and long, unreadable terms and conditions. This had left people feeling understandably confused. They were less and less equipped to understand things like insurance, retirement, or the basic financial products that would help them achieve their goals. Generative AI helped people understand these things because there was no longer a need for one-size-fits-all explanations. And these changes in AI meant not only that people felt enriched by digital experiences, it also meant that humans were free to provide value where they were most valuable. Everything is conversational because the best way to, that's the best way to understand and meet each individual's emotional needs. It's always nice to take a moment and see how far we've come. 
You live in a future that was revolutionized by the changes in technology that happened in the early 2020s. That technology successfully delivered on the vision of Alan Turing. It passed the Turing test. But predicting the future is difficult. And in many ways, the future we live in isn't the one that people expected. In the 1950s, when we began this story, visions of the future were often framed by the way people at that moment saw the world. Many people found it difficult to see outside of the things they were used to, things that were so obvious that they took them for granted. And at the same time, when faced with rapid change, people had often made the opposite mistake, to assume that technological process, progress will continue to move at an ever accelerating pace, that problems will be solved, that development can be extrapolated into the future as a curve that always goes up. With hindsight, this is obvious to see. And we now live in a world that represents a mix of these things. Three-day weekends are the norm now, but we still have to go to work. People have more choice than ever on how to access their money, but they still need large financial organizations to look after that money or insure them against unexpected events. AI is capable of doing many things, but human contact is still highly valued because humans were never just the things, just things that computers could easily replace. In 2019, we found a way to talk to computers in our own language. This changed the good, the way we interacted with technology and the way it interacts with us. Because of this, I haven't had to think about filling out a form in the last 20 years. I've got used to listening to a personalized news summary every morning while I take the hover bus to work. The chatbots of the past are a distant memory Today, I can have a conversation with a computer that meets my emotional needs. As we've seen, computers learning to talk was a big deal, but it was also just the beginning because it turns out we had quite a lot to talk about. Thanks for listening. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, just, just to, yeah, just to, just to highlight this fact. Obviously, I think the problem with with one of these talks is that they always embrace a certain kind of artifice when talking about the future. And I thought it made sense just to be explicit about that. Well, the reality is there's lots of things that we don't understand. But I hope I've at least partially convinced you of some of my arguments about how I think things will evolve, what I think are more inevitable consequences. Although there's obviously lots that we can't predict. All of the things from 2023 are real. I didn't type any of them in manually. They all came directly out of our systems. And if you want to see any of those features, find us at the end or drop me an email. Thank you. Um